Welcome to day two. The 15th marked the third anniversary of the channel, and as a way to say thank you, I've decided to put together another marathon for you guys. I've also decided to bring back the merch store for everyone asking, and just for the occasion, click on the link in the pinned comment to receive 25% off any item you like. I'm also going to be hosting a live stream Q&A session for day three, so go over to my Twitter to check on the dates and times. With all that said, thank you so much for an amazing three years so far, and let's begin. The title of this video may lead you to assume my stance on the topic at hand, but actually this video was not made to please hardcore skeptics or to bash believers. Instead, I'd like to remain somewhere in between. The divide is strong, but oddly enough the opposing sides don't appear to be all that different. Both seem to believe they know the truth and have all the answers. Some say ghosts are real, others say they aren't, but can they actually prove their claims through the use of concrete evidence? Of course, the answer is no. All we truly know on the topic is that we know nothing. We believe things, sure, and people are entitled to those beliefs, but at this point there isn't any way to even study the matter, and therefore no way to draw an actual conclusion. This is the central point of this video. Sure, the title is a bit strong, but is there anything inherently wrong with investigating things we don't understand? Of course not. Crazy questions are exactly how we got to where we are today. When gaps in knowledge are found, it's simply in our nature to go looking for answers, no matter how absurd the question may seem. No, ghost hunting, paranormal investigating, whatever you'd like to call it, is not a pointless endeavor and in itself not at all a problem, but rather a good thing. For all we know, one day we may not discover ghosts per se, but something entirely different. Imagine how crazy the concept of cells and bacteria sounded when they were first discovered. So, given all this, what exactly am I trying to say if I'm not calling ghost hunting stupid? Well, again, the issue isn't in the pursuit of understanding the unknown, but rather in the methods used and the misuse of very definitive words such as evidence or proof. Amongst friends and family, I like to call this underpants gnome logic. This is a bit of a silly way to explain it, but bear with me here in case you have no idea what I'm talking about. In the TV show South Park, there's an episode that involves the reoccurring appearance of gnomes that sneak into the rooms of unsuspecting children in order to steal their underwear. It's later revealed that the gnomes wanted them for something rather huge they had planned, specifically business. When explaining their business model to the confused boys, it was revealed their plan had three phases. Collect underpants, question mark, profit. Now, how do underpants lead to profit? I have no idea, and neither does anyone else, including the gnomes themselves, but my point is, this is very much the same logic that plagues many, not all, but many who investigate the paranormal. Let's talk about evidence. Evidence isn't always proof. Evidence is subject to investigation in itself because if the evidence is bogus or unreliable, then it's ultimately inconclusive and can't be used to support a case. EVPs, or electronic voice phenomena, are commonly referred to as evidence of the paranormal. The paranormal, just to clarify, is typically defined as something not explainable by modern science. Now, what exactly are EVPs? In essence, they're sounds or voices found in audio recordings that are believed to be caused by ghosts, spirits, demons, or any other paranormal beings. EVPs are definitely creepy, don't get me wrong. But the underpants gnome logic rings strong here. Again, in order to even be considered paranormal, the recordings would need to be inherently inexplicable. Without even getting into the science aspect of things, there are already a ton of issues to be taken into account here. For example, when we're presented with an EVP, we need to take the investigator's word for it that the area surrounding the recording device was completely silent and not subject to contamination. But was it really, though? Ghost hunting is commonly carried out in places with a lot of history. Old cemeteries, abandoned buildings, and on top of that they're usually done at night. If a simple audio recording device is supposed to be able to capture spirit voices, then it would obviously be able to capture pretty much everything else from wind, clothing, footsteps, animals, insects, things that someone in a dark, spooky place may not even notice while carrying out an investigation. There's just no way to 100% guarantee that what was captured wasn't some other natural occurrence that was simply misinterpreted as a voice. That brings me to my next point. Misinterpretation. The most convincing of EVPs are the ones where you can clearly make out words or phrases. How do we explain those? Pareidolia is a psychological phenomenon where, in essence, your mind plays tricks on you by perceiving a familiar pattern that isn't actually there. 
It's the reason why some people see faces in clouds or other everyday things such as food, buildings, and furniture. And yes, this can also explain certain paranormal photographs and even stem into audio. Think of EVPs as an audio inkblot test, something that the listener can interpret any way he or she sees fit. Expectations and suggestions also play a huge role in how we perceive things. I won't bore you with a full-on psychology lecture here, but if you didn't skip class, then you may remember the concepts of top-down and bottom-up processing. In short, and to grossly oversimplify, bottom-down processing involves basing our perceptions around a stimulus and the data it provides. Top-down processing is where we already have prior knowledge of a stimulus and base our thoughts in it around pre-existing knowledge. Like how we're able to read typos despite the words being wrong. Our brains are able to fill in the gaps since we already know what the words are supposed to say, and yes, this very much plays into the aforementioned pareidolia. Anyway, if I just lost you, then allow me to demonstrate with an example instead. I'm sure you've heard of the many tinfoil hat theories centering on subliminal messages in music, especially when played in reverse. Some of the most well-known have come from artists such as Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, Queen, and many, many more. Of course, some artists do this intentionally, but not in every case. I'd play some of these examples for you now, but I can't for obvious reasons. Instead, I'll be doing a demo with music provided by Andy Negative. First, let's listen to the audio played forward. I would fake every, every single smile. There is no and now, in reverse. So chances are you didn't hear much, but the hidden message here is this. Here, listen again. Okay, so you may have sort of been able to make things out the first time, but with the help of subtitles, you were able to follow along way better, I'm assuming. Of course, there isn't actually a hidden message here, but seeing the text on screen provides your brain with an idea for what it's supposed to be looking for within the audio, allowing you to sync the two up. What I explained here can also apply to EVPs. EVPs, when presented in videos online or in TV shows, often come with subtitles that influence your perception of what you're hearing. Without them, we'd most likely have a much more difficult time making them out. Of course, EVPs aren't the only examples of evidence used in favor of the paranormal, but my point still stands. Data is data, but how it's interpreted is entirely dependent on whoever's looking at it. It's a common piece of advice amongst paranormal investigation groups to research as much about a location as possible before exploring it. And while, yes, preparing yourself is always a great idea and definitely a must, it's almost counterproductive in some ways due to the risk of fueling expectations that will inevitably compromise a study. And sure, one could argue that other things, such as EMF readers, are much more reliable in the sense that they're just numbers. EMF stands for electromagnetic fields. The theory here being that the paranormal are able to manipulate these waves whether intentionally or not. I'll spare you another lecture here. Just know that just like EVPs, EMF readings are also subject to contamination in the sense that many, many different things give off electromagnetic fields, even in places where you wouldn't expect. If ghosts were able to manipulate or produce these fields, there wouldn't be a reliable way to separate them out from everything else anyway. So sadly, no. This is in no way credible evidence, much less proof. The same issues can be seen in pretty much every other device used to gather evidence of the paranormal. The tools, although reliable, many times find themselves in the wrong hands. Again, underpants gnome logic. Strange sound, question mark, proof of ghosts. Electromagnetic spike, question mark, proof of ghosts. Strange image, question mark, proof of ghosts. That middle step is absolutely crucial if you're going to go as far as claiming something as undeniable evidence. This is very much a show your work type of deal. The variable here is how or why. Why exactly is it most likely to be this and not simple human error? The process of elimination has been completely ignored here, and frankly, doing so is ultimately more damaging to the cause overall. And the thing is, Underpants Gnome logic isn't just about that unknown variable, but also insanity. The gnomes collect tidy whities every night, eventually accumulating piles and piles of them despite having no idea what to actually do with them. They do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. This is exactly what we see in a lot of these groups. Location after location, investigation after investigation, and very little progress. Just the same inconclusive results. Now, I can't see what the natural follow-up question to this may be. Maybe this is the best we can do. 
who else is actually making an effort to study the paranormal? Actually, a lot more people than you think. In fact, we humans have been questioning the afterlife and trying to justify the existence of a human soul for as far back as we know now. It's just something that we've never been able to come up with an answer to. The philosophical debates are endless. Many interpret the soul as energy, or an intangible part of your overall being, but at one point in human history it was said that people obtained their souls via the semen of their fathers, while their mothers simply provided a safe place for the embryo to develop. As you can imagine, no one is exactly certain, even in today's society, what the exact definition of a soul or ghost should even be. If that's the case, then how do we even go looking for it? You may have heard of the popular 21 Grams case an experiment carried out in 1901 by Dr. Duncan McDougall. So in short, McDougall wanted to see if a soul had weight and decided to test this by placing six terminally ill patients on a scale in order to see if any changes would appear during the time of death. One patient out of the six lost 21.3 grams at the time of death. Another two lost weight at the time of death, but oddly lost more weight a few minutes later, while another two were dismissed citing issues with the scale being used. Ironically, one of the patients actually did lose weight but then regained it shortly after. As you can imagine, this experiment was in many ways flawed for a number of reasons. As for the one case where the patient did indeed lose weight at the right time, this has been dismissed by many as simply the result of sweat or other fluids leaving the body. This has also been widely deemed a case of selective reporting, but despite this, it managed to popularize the idea that the soul does in fact weigh approximately 21 grams. If there's anything to learn here, it's that having a PhD doesn't necessarily make you smart. Anyway, there have of course been many, many more attempts at understanding the human soul throughout mankind's existence, but that would honestly turn into several hours worth of video, so I suggest you check it out for yourself if it's a topic you're interested in. I personally recommend reading Spook by Mary Roach, since she does go into a few things I mentioned here in detail within the book. No, I wasn't paid to say that, but I wish I was. So my point in making this video is not at all to say that ghosts aren't real. After all, I can't disprove them by any means, but by that same token, no one can actually prove them either. Is there anything inherently wrong with the act of ghost hunting? No, especially not when done for fun. It's an activity I personally find enjoyable. The issue only comes up when throwing around words like proof and evidence while not taking into account personal biases or possible flaws within an investigation. We very much should be trying to understand things we don't, but muddying the waters with bogus proof and evidence only makes things harder for us in the long run. Remember kids, don't fall victim to underpants gnome logic.